So our next topic is uh, problem-based learning. I took a leave of absence in 2000 and went to UCLA to do a geriatric fellowship. And there I was meeting with a medical educator and she was telling me about, oh, this you know, curriculum reform that was going on at UCLA. And it was around problem-based learning. And problem-based learning is really incorporating active learning into the curriculum, but it's consonant with the theory of adult learning. And you think about that was 2000, and that was like the big push when problem-based learning became very prevalent in medical school curriculums. We've been very behind on this, but we're finally there in looking at really incorporating problem-based learning. So when I came back from the fellowship, one of the came back, I was going to revive our you know, geriatric uh, curriculum and started a day. And so I had eight hours, basically, to do geriatrics, <laughs> but it was a day. And the last thing people wanted to do was listen to me drone on for eight hours. I didn't want to listen to myself <laughs> you know, for eight hours. And so really using those concepts of problem-based learning and how it's really, I'm much more inspired to give lectures. I think in seminars and using problem-based learning, it's much more engaging. I learn a lot doing it this way because you're using cases, people are looking things up, they're finding things you didn't know. And so it can be very stimulating and engaging. I really encourage you to use this concepts of it with every seminar that you do. Aristotle said, what we have to learn to do, we learn by doing. We don't learn by just sitting there and listening. We learn by actually doing. So why do it? What is it? How do you get started? Why do it? So now we're at a stage in medical education where most of the students are, are in medical schools. The majority of medical schools have problem-based learning. So the residents are coming in and they're expecting that. As I said, it follows the themes of adult learning theory. It makes sense, it works. And it promotes self-learning. I mean, part of our job is that we want to develop lifelong learning skills. And problem-based learning is a way to do that. What is adult learning? You really, adult learners want to, they want the topic to be relevant to them. They want to be able to use it right away. They want to participate. They don't want to just sit there. And they want to have it focused on problems. Problems that are relevant and timely. <clears throat> Adult learners are more apt to take responsibility for their own learning. I want to look this up. I want to learn about this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this online course. So much more active, they're much more proactive. They want to be able to apply it immediately into what they're doing. How is this going to apply to what I'm doing? Adult learning involves cycles of action and reflection. So you go through a problem, you look up whatever the case is, but then reflection, well, how can I apply that to a different situation? What if this would happen? What if there was a twist in the story? How would that be different in this patient population? And adult learning is based on really respect and mutual trust. You're learning together. You're not judging anyone. It's participatory. Everyone is involved. And you learn from each other. It involves active learning. You may have heard this, but what I hear I forget. What I see I remember. But what I do I understand. So you can't just give a lecture, and that's why the visuals, too, are so important, to kind of see, to imprint, to really hone in on those topics, those key points you want the audience to take back with them. But then when you break up, you do a case that then emphasizes those take-home points, that's when people then start to understand. Yes, maybe the knowledge is there. With the le after the lecture, I can take a test. But now I can apply this to something else. And that's where problem-based learning supersedes just giving a lecture. 
we look at what's called the learning pyramid. How do people learn? And Kathleen was talking about Medina's book, you know, in terms of the reputation, but really when you also look at things, and you know, we touched on this with the visuals, if you just do auditory, if you just do the lecture, it's probably less than 10% retention. You add audiovisual, you add more of a case, you then have people do it. And the best way to learn a topic is to teach it. So, because you can learn it, but then if you have to explain it to someone else, you know you really know it. So that's what's called the learning pyramid. So what are the essentials? How do you get started? You start with cases, cases you've had. So you make it real. Maybe put a few twists in, put a few cases together. It's active and it's learner directed. You focus on both the cognitive skills as well as the knowledge. So we're looking at, when we look at what are the key components of learning, you have the knowledge, but you're also looking at attitudes and cognitive skills. We teach procedures. So there's a lot of cognitive skills that we teach. So it's not just this, these are the facts. This is how renal physiology works. But we're looking at all different aspects of cognition. Really, it's fairly simple looking at, you know, you need small groups, probably not more than four to six is pretty ideal. I do is have a, have a case, have people break up into cases, break up into groups, the small groups, analyze the case, give some EBM questions or doing some research. If it's more of a looking at communication skills, you can look at doing some role plays within the small groups. I think role plays are best within small groups. It's very hard to do that in a, in a larger group format. And then you bring the group back together and make sure people are on the same page. And you're having people teach each other. And it's really just, it becomes a you know, much more interactive, much more stimulating way of teaching. How to do it. So the, you know, the ways to do it, uh, sometimes I'll start just with a mini lecture. So this is like the 20, 15, 20 minutes. Key points. This is what I want you to know. And then of those key points, I really emphasize those in cases. Have people then work through the cases and then report back. And as I said before, you could also then have the case go through the presentation have questions go through a presentation. So it can be problem-based in different ways. You don't have to necessarily have people in groups. You can have, but having breakpoints within a lecture where people stop, reflect, look something up, go just a little bit further into the case. I also have asked residents to bring cases. In geriatrics, I ask them to bring their cases. Then they get a lot out of it. So you're doing a thyroid diseases. Bring a case, bring your questions, so they can really make it relevant to them. And then they take home something. And then what we have, it's called the flip model. Uh, so the flip classroom, where you're sending material ahead of time. So this is my mini lecture, podcast, read this article and come prepared. So then we can kind of jump right into the cases. We can avoid them in the lecture. It's, that model's been very successful in undergraduate uh, collegiate education. It's a little bit more difficult with residents, you know, and just a time for them to expect. But if it's a short podcast, short video, 15 minutes, that's very reasonable. And then you can really utilize the time you have together for true learning. You then are the coach. You know, this, you know, it's you become more the coach. Not so much this is what I'm telling you, but then you're the facilitator. You're really trying to stimulate, engage, pro ask probing questions to have the residents, the students come up with the answer. Your role is not to tell them the answer, but to help them critically analyze the question and help them find the right resources to find the answers to the question. <clears throat> the best teacher is the one who suggests rather than dogmatizes 
and inspires his or her listener with a wish to teach themselves. Again, going back to that concept of lifelong learning and problem-based learning is one way that you can then inspire people like, okay, we did this case, we looked it up, this is, I'm going to go back to this source, we'll look this case up later. You promote a safe atmosphere and with small groups, especially if it's four people, four to six, you have a small group that is safe and people can give an answer, may not be right, and that's fine. It uses a safe place where people can test and continually explore. Again, we're asking open-ended questions as a facilitator. We're not giving the answer. Any other ideas? Why did you come to that conclusion? Have you considered this or this? So really, again, we're, as facilitators, coach, we're not the lecturer, the teacher. So the take-home points, you know, problem-based learning, I think it's essential in medical education. It really builds on all the adult learning theory. It is effective, and it definitely can be a much more engaging way to deliver the material.